Hello and welcome back to the lab. Today on the bench, as starting with most of these videos, is a box. I apologize for my voice. I have been recovering from being exceptionally ill for the past three weeks. So uh, I have not been in the lab. I have not been behind the camera. It has been a really rough go. But uh, I am improving and getting better, so videos will once again be commencing. In this particular video, we are going to take a look at something that has been featured on the channel before, but I am finishing a lab, uh, something that's been bugging me with the lab for a little while. Uh, this one came from the normal, some of the normal places, and is actually pretty well packed for shipping in. Let's get through here. That doesn't look bad at all. Well, uh, looks like this one comes from us from... That didn't sound good. Uh, there is something rattle trappy going on in there, so we're gonna have... Oh, there's a screw that just fell out. That doesn't bode well. Uh, let's see... Well, it's been to the tech service center every once in a while, and we are property of Bank of the West. Now, this particular one actually has the side panels on, so that's a plus. Uh, let us see what may have shaken loose here. Oh, there it is right there. That screws loose. So that's not too bad. Very cool. Um, it was pointed out in the comments of the 501 video that I talked about the distinct lack of bulk filter caps in a 501. This has these three filters here and a much chunkier transformer. On the 501, the transformer that was on the back side of the board, that's actually a high frequency switching supply, and that's why the bulk caps were tantalums and not as large. One of the main problems with the high frequency supply is it, it attributes to some of the noise of that unit. The other, um, the other thing attributing to the noise of the 501, this is excluding the 501A, but just the 501, is the fact that the A to Ds were all built with discrete components. They weren't integrated A to Ds. So that was one of the reasons why the... Uh, unit was such a struggle to uh, calibrate. So, let's see what we have on the front. This does have the temperature probe option. And we are a DM502A on this one. We do have all the normal buttons. However, we have some buttons that are smashed in here. So we're going to have to... As with all of these, we have to address the switching. It's not a huge deal. These actually don't feel too bad, but we will service them anyway. And let's see, did this get smashed? Eh, it does look like it's popped up a little bit. We'll see if we can't get that knocked back down. But uh, yeah, all in all, not too bad. Um, let's throw some power on it and at least sanity check it. Make sure it doesn't release the magic smoke. What's also good about this one is I actually have the side panels. I don't know why. But for some reason, these seem to invariably, the side panels seem to go away. Like half of my, yeah, probably half of my units don't have, they have the uh, noise shield on them, but they don't have side panels. It's really strange. Okay, I've got the power cord plugged in. We're ready to go. Well, that's a good sign to start with. Let's see. DC volts, auto, yeah. Let's ask our power supply for five volts. Good enough for being at a cow. We will definitely fix the cow. We'll run it up against the uh, 7510 and bring it back into specification. That is not a problem at all. Okay, so this at least sanity checks it. That means We'll throw some capacitors in there and uh, service the switches, and then we'll see what happens. We'll run it through a calibration and 
see if this really needs anything or if it's good to go as is. I mean, definitely Cal's out, so, but I did not expect this to not be, not have the Cal out. Um, every single unit that I have brought in the lab, so all seven of the DM502s that I have, this is going to be the eighth and fill up that plug in. That's what's been bothering me is that four bay power, power supply, uh, having a hole in it so if this if this repair goes according to plan that will then be a full unit and we'll have eight meters uh for looking at multi-rail supplies now i like having these meters they're very inexpensive um on certain auction sites and uh they're three and a half digit, which is totally fine. But when I'm working on a scope or something with a multi-rail power supply and I have to troubleshoot some of these Tektronic power supplies that are referencing themselves all over the place, it's really nice to see every power rail at the same time. So with having these meters that, uh, I think catalog price on these things was like $1,200. Um, they don't go for anywhere near that these days. Uh, but they're good three and a half uh, digit meters. The 502 is a three and a half. 502 A is a three and a half. Sorry, they're perfectly good. Three and a half digit meters. They're great for a bunch of miscellaneous work. But uh, yeah, I wanted to get the last one to finish off that frame, and then I can call that corner, at least that small corner of the bench, complete, because the bench is a work in progress, and uh, I'm sure it will never be, never be totally finished. Um, there's always there will always be something to do. So. We'll get to it, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, I have the new capacitors put in. Uh, these three guys right here. Now, it turns out that screw that was missing was not down here. This was a much larger screw that uh, I needed to get out of the recesses of the lab. The screw that was running around was in here. So I really don't know what we're going to find once we clean this thing up. Because uh, if, if this screw's missing completely and this screw's gone, someone's been in here. I'm not 100% sure what they have found, but someone has been inside. Uh, the unit does look complete, though, so um, the only thing we can do is see what comes up in a calibration and alignment. So, for right now, let's pop it into the frame, make sure the frame's off. And uh, make sure we didn't do anything crazy like reverse polarity on the uh, electrolytic capacitors, because that gets exciting. Nah, looks good. So I'm going to let this run for a little while, make sure that the uh, caps don't get cranky and have problems. And then uh, also make sure when the unit warms up, it doesn't show any other major symptoms. Then we'll get into cleaning the controls and uh, making these front panel buttons feel, feel right. Okay, I have just finished up an alignment on this particular DMM. I did note while I was working on it that the last time this was aligned was in 89. So it was due in 90. Um, it's missed a few years, but we're in 2023. So here we go. Everything's good and stable with the power supply. Everything lined up. This one didn't give me any problems. So it was slightly out of alignment. Um, not horrible, actually. Minor adjustments on everything just to bring it into agreement with my 7510. Uh, it is also good to note that when doing an alignment on a DMM like this or any piece of equipment, especially a, uh, any, well, any DMM, um, the performance checks and the alignments do require extremely elevated voltages. Uh, the alignment on this one's not too bad. The worst voltage you have to... Um, you have to work around is 100 volts AC. However, the performance checks are another story. They, um, the performance check, which is an exhaustive test of the meter, um, checking all of its features, all of its functions, all of its ranges, you do need a 1,000 volt supply. So you have to put 1,000 volts on the front end to check the highest ranges. So especially when working with those types of voltages, definitely take care. So just a quick run through since I have some probes hooked up. Uh, I have a 14.8K resistor on the resistance as it was measured and confirmed with the DMM7510. So our resistance range is good. I'm going to fire up a couple of um, 
I actually have the SMU hooked up. So next we'll just spot check some current ranges. We'll set this up for some current ranges. We will go to um, milliamps DC. That's what I want. And we'll move this over here. Now the other thing that's really cool about the uh, using the SMU for this is I actually can directly measure the burden voltage of the resistor that's in here. Um, so let's set it to auto mode and we'll ask the SMU to give me, let's see, we want to source current and measure voltage. And so I want the SMU to give me, let's say two milliamps. And voltage limit of 21 volts, that'll be fine. We'll hit it with two milliamps. And there's our two milliamps of current. Um, the current range doesn't work in auto mode. Okay, no big deal. I'm not gonna be using this to measure current much. I have better tools in the lab for that. Let me show you the source measure unit. So taking a look at the SMU, we have a 21 millivolt burden voltage across the current resistor in the meter. This is obviously gonna change as we go up. Let's ask it for 20 milliamps. Actually, let's turn the output off. 20 amps, no, 20 milliamps, there we go. And I'll set the meter up, so, or I'll set the uh, DMM up so it won't be damaged by 20 milliamps. We'll turn on the output and we have 20 milliamps and we'll trigger a measurement. So the burden voltage actually increases as the current increases through the current shunt as to be expected, direct Ohm's law. So we went up to 30 millivolts. Um, let's hit the meter with about as much as it's gonna take. We will kick it to its highest range because it can take this and I'm gonna actually ask for it for an amp. And that is an amp and we are actually at 600 millivolts of burden voltage at an amp. Now this meter tops out at two amps so we'll ask it for 1.5. and we overrange the SMU. So the SMU, this SMU is not a high current SMU. Um, it's actually, this is actually the baby of the line. You wouldn't think so for the price point, but that's right, this one, this one's power envelope tops out at, at, at one amp. So I am stuck. At an amp, so, but we are quite happily measuring an amp on the meter. So that's good, let's try some voltages now. Okay, we have the meter hooked up, set up for voltages and auto mode, which makes this easier. And we do, let's ask for two volts from the power supply. Looks good. Uh, five volts, happy. Uh, 16.5, just for something random. And there we go. So the meter section is working very well, and everything's good. So let me finish up putting this back together, and then we'll plug that very last hole. One other thing happened as I, as I was putting this back together that I remembered. Uh, this capacitor was actually physically leaking some of its internal substance and definitely needed to be replaced. This, however, is a very sh is a very odd capacitor because it is a 10 microfarad electrolytic, but it is also a bipolar capacitor because it's in the AC path. So this one, if you ever need to change this this cap, must be a bipolar um, because it is because being in the AC path and actually in the AC gain circuit, it is exposed to positive and negative going voltages, reference to ground and electrolytic caps when they are reverse biased and they're not bipolar get cranky about that so 
Um, other than that, nothing really major. These three caps in the power supply, I do that for good measure just because I'm in here. And I like the units when I get finished with them. They're good for a very long time, so I like it being one and done. So I got to put the shield back on, get side panels back on, and then we'll be done. Okay, so it's all back together. One of the things I did do was I replaced the lens. I had to spare one of these. It had a ton of just junk on it, and I tried wiping this off and buffing this off, and it did not come off the, uh, the red lens. So I went ahead and replaced it since I had another one that was labeled the same. It just had a darker border on it. Now, the other thing is, this, pol this plastic can be polished with emery paper and, and buffed and everything like that. The problem is, these are painted onto the plastic. So if you try to buff this plastic, you'll buff this paint off. You can actually feel it's raised over here. So you have to be careful cleaning some of this, as you don't want to scrape this off, because this tells you when you're in the microamp range and the, and the mega ohm range, based on the LEDs. So... Since I had the spare parts, I used them, and this is going to be a, a normal bench meter for me, so it was okay for that. Okay, here's where the meter's going to live. And I don't think that frame's plugged in. One sec. It was not. So that hole has been bugging me for quite some time, so I'm glad I was able to fill it with a meter finally, and we are good to go. Actually, both frames work. So, just to look at um, multi-rail power supplies, things like that, I can watch everything and not worry about it. So, thanks for stopping by the lab and taking a look at the uh, DM502A restoration. The final one, hopefully, unless someone out there in YouTube land ships me another one to repair. Uh, I am done. I am off the DM502 market, so I'm set. We're good to go, so I'm not arguing out there trying to pick up the last one. So, as always, I will see everyone in the next video. More is always on the way. And until then, I will see everybody in the comments.